I mean, I talk to excipient suppliers sometimes, and they say, you know, the guys who are developing that product, they they really didn't consult us. They did, really didn't try and understand what's going to work, what isn't going to work. And the main point between between strategic supply chain management is you actually engage with the end user of your product the same way as Apple would or, you know, any company who really builds value in, into their products. Welcome to CMC Live. This is the show where we discuss CMC regulations and guidances simplified through real-life experiences and risk-based advice. Each episode, we speak with subject matter experts as well as other leading industry authorities. With your host, Ed Narkey. Welcome to CMC Live. Today, we have another very special, excellent guest, and we'll be talking about some very important things. Headley Rees is on the show. During his 40-year stint working in the pharma industry, Headley realized that there was and continues to be something seriously wrong with how medicines come to market. Globally, drug prices are rising, clinical trial failures are more common than successes, and large sums of money are spent on patent litigation. To correct this and approach the modernization in the industry, Headley has written a book titled Taming the Pharma Monster and has used his consultancy PharmaFlow as well as Welsh-led initiative Friends of Medicines Modernization to organize a Medicines for the 21st Century Conference. Headley is joining us today from Wales in the UK, and will be sharing some of his thoughts on a few things. Taking medicines back to the future, cutting through the QBD foliage. Yes, we can revisit QBD 10 years later. And something I think is very special and the reason we started talking about 10 years ago. I'm talking with Headley about how your supply chain is actually your value chain. So Headley, let's get this episode started by going in some of your background, how you got started and get your thoughts on a few things. And perhaps, why did you describe the pharma industry as a monster in the title of your new book? Okay, thanks, Ed. I am um, trained as a production engineer, so um, I learned how to make things, so to start with the end users of your product and then construct something that creates value for them. So I learned that outside the pharma, in 1980, I joined Bayer, Bayer in, the, in the UK, a manufacturing plant. So I cut my teeth on Alka-Seltzer, um, sterile injectables, the whole range of products that, you know, fairly standard for, for the industry. I spent 16 years there. I then did a, a, about 12 years going through various biotech companies. These were the larger biotechs. In 2004, five, I worked with Genentech <coughs> launching Tarsiva, a drug for non-small cell lung cancer, which uh, successfully launched and became a, a, a blockbuster. And But because it launched in the US, I was based in Oxford and they made me redundant. So they were very kind to me. They actually sent me off to with a, with, with a piece of money to set up uh, a business of, of my own. At the time, I thought it was a bit sort of um, going to be difficult. And it was actually quite difficult because selling supply chain management skills to biotech companies who wanted to make an exit was a bit of a def- difficult sell. So I talked to a CEO of a small biotech and I say, look, you know, we could do this for your supply chain, make it make it more effective. And they say, well, I'm hoping to make an exit next year. So that'll be someone else's problem. Hence, we don't need we don't need your skills. So that's what made me start to write, because um, I realized I had to build an understanding in the in- industry that it's the supply chain that actually delivers the product to, to the, the, the patients, the people who pay for it. So without a supply chain, you haven't got a business. So um, in 2008, 2009, the editor of uh, Wiley Pharmaceutical Sciences in Hoboken, uh, Jonathan Rose, he sent me an email saying, I've seen the training you do on your website and that format would suit the book quite well. So would you like to um, write a book? So and that published in 2011. And you kindly contributed a large section on QBD to that, Ed, which I'm still very grateful for. Uh, the final chapter explained how disconnected the industry had come, how it's full of handovers, discovery research, hands over to development, ha- development hand over to commercial, and no one can question whether a molecule is suitable for manufacture or not. And I, I sort of put in a number of suggestions about reintegrating, reducing the amount of outsourcing, 
uh, link in discovery research up with development so it becomes one design function. And uh, the book sold in 70 odd countries, but only as a sort of niche. A, a, a niche application, so only people who were really interested bought it. Um, and I thought maybe people would change, but not, not, not a lot happened. So I thought I'm going to have to write something that's more accessible to the man in the street or, you know, people easy to understand. So that was Taming the Big Farmer Monster. And I explained there how the whole dynamic over the last 40 years based on patents and, and searching for, you know, a painted in molecule has been completely unhelpful. You put that in with the degree of outsourcing and the, the other sort of um, what I call outthrowing, which is dropping out of patent products when they, they've enjoyed their patent protection for all those years. So I've become passionate about the whole thing about change. And in 2000 and, 2017, I wrote an article by a gentleman called Bob Gaines, Robert Gaines, he he wrote germ, uh, germ theory, but he also wrote an article titled something like 75 years after penicillin. And he actually explained the penicillin, the whole end-to-end -end life cycle of penicillin. And although Alexander Fleming discovered a mold, it, it, didn't, it took him 12 years to understand the, the active ingredient in the mold. And... It was Oxford University that helped him do that. They could make enough for small quantities for clinical trials, and they actually proved that this penicillium or penicillin was was actually working in animal models, and it actually helped a few soldiers in the war survive. But they couldn't make any more than small gram quantities, so they actually flew to the forerunner to the FDA, uh, the US Depart Department of Agriculture. And there was a guy there called uh, Andrew J. Moyer, he was an expert in, wait for it, manufacture. He knew how to culture a mould so that he could exponentially increase the yield. And it was that process that was used then by the big pharma companies, the Pfizer's, the Merck's, etc., to bring penicillin to market. And Moya actually held the patent and he was inducted into the US Hall of Fame in 1987, I think it was. So actually, it was a huge collaborative effort between the scientists who made the discovery, the chemists and the, you know whoever isolated the API and run the clinical trials and the preclinical work, but also the manufacturing guy. And if they'd all been together at the same time, instead of taking 16 years for penicillin to come to market, it would take maybe four years because they would have been looking at where do we need to get to with this penicillin? It's a mold, you know, and you would engage with a mold expert. So, and that that was a huge finding for me as part of the research I've been doing, because that said, well, Fleming was a doctor. He was a physician. Jonas Salk was a physician who uh, um, invented the polio vaccine or developed the polio vaccine, who never patented it. The Ban Banting and his researchers, the three who sold the, the patent for penicillin for $3, they were physicians, you know, in those days, doctors and physicians led the charge in developing drugs. And some of them even injected themselves with their compounds to prove that they worked. And manufacture then was regarded as an important part of the end product, because until you had the evidence it, the drug was working, you, you, you know, they weren't committed to manufacture. So. That's where I got the taking medicines back to the future. If you could go back to Fleming's day and actually say, let's capture this, let's capture the model that you've got there, and let's get everyone together at the start with healthcare professionals, and first of all, we'll decide, do we need a medicine? You know, Is there some other preventative or some other um, way, way of dealing with this condition? If you need a medicine, then you bring all the right people together, and you plan the whole thing as one discrete development program, the same way as you develop a plane, a car, or anything else. So that's it, not quite in a nutshell, but so that's where I am today. Okay, Hadley, that's great. And uh, we'll come back to taming the big pharma monster shortly. So back to the uh, taking 
Medicines Back to the Future. Uh, this is available on your blog site under PharmaFlow if you Google that. I had a couple questions, and um, you list the under, underpinning principles for this this concept. One of them that are that's a kind of interesting to me and probably our group here and some of our clients, you talk about supply chains and how they should be designed strategically and making them simple and streamlined. Can you flush this out and talk a little bit? I mean, I talk to excipient suppliers sometimes, and they say, you know, the guys who are developing that product, they... They really didn't consult us. They did, really didn't try and understand what's going to work, what isn't going to work. And the main point between between strategic supply chain management is you actually engage with the end user of your product the same way as Applewood or you know any company who really builds value in, into their products. You, you 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 actually develop the product with your end users, build the value in. And then you build your supply chain and you include your suppliers when you're designing the product. You don't sort of specify, well, you know, so-and-so will be the supplier of that excipient, so-and-so will be the supplier of that. You actually look for broader relationships with companies who really are bringing expertise to them. So you're not buying products, you're buying knowledge uh, from these companies. There's one guy, Brian Carlin, he's well known in the, um, he's an excipient iconoclast. And I've had, I had this conversation with you years ago. And, you know, there's so much knowledge out there, and yet they don't really get in, engaged in optimizing the process. So and as you go through drug product and then pack, final packaging, you know, why do we have five or six stages? Why don't we make the whole thing under one roof? When I was a Bayer in 1980, we used to bring raw materials in the back door, and we'd ship out finished product out the front door to hospitals and clinics around the UK. And we'd ship overseas to other Bayer entities, and they would do exactly the same thing. So there was a direct connection with the business and patients, hospitals, clinics. And it, you know, it was so much more efficient. One quality system, the only sort of movements are in the plant movements, uh, and you, you look at where we are now, and this is one reason why quality by, by design isn't isn't working because it's going to cost you a fortune if you are a drugs uh, if you are sponsored a clinical trial, you're going to have to buy that, uh, that that from the service providers who are you know you're providing that because you know it's it's all it it's all in the supply base and it's all fee for service stuff. I, I'm not saying it's not good quality service, but. People think, well, you know, I just do it the old way. I just pick the materials and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll do, do the minimum. Right. So one thing that resonated a while back, probably when we first started talking, I think I saw it was a, either a blog or some a book, I thought. I searched for the book and I maybe it's out of stock or something, but it was called uh, something like how your supply chain is actually your value chain. I think that was your your concept, right? Whosoever it was, I, I use it all the time now to try to explain, you know, kind of what you're you're setting up here. But you know, building a value chain there from our end, if you have a good supply chain, a value chain, you know, it, it could come back to you through, you know, the, the price of your product, uh, meaning that if someone was, was licensing your product, you know, there's more value created by a compliant process that comes, you know, that's consistent and those type of things like that. Did you want to say anything more about that, the value chain? Yeah, well, it's it's strange because even in the more advanced sectors, it's still called the supply chain. Um as, again, as I've researched various books and things, Michael po- Professor Michael Porter at Harvard, he is probably the world's best authority on supply chain management. He doesn't know it. He doesn't know it. But if you look at the Porter value chain model, uh, he talks about the difference. You know, competitive advantage is a mix of value-adding activities. And value-add is not just some, some you know, theory, but it, it means will people pay you cash money for what you do into that product, where they come in and buy it and give you the, the, the money. So sometimes when people say, I'm adding value here because I'm doing something good. Well, if a customer is not going to pay you for it, it's not value. And in the same way, all the activities you've got in the business, they, they are cost and the, the value you add, the money you bring in has got to be less than the cost that you incur in the business. And then you obviously make a profit grow and competitive advantage is created both by the value-adding activities and by the cost af- activities, and, and they both work, work together. Um, and Porter talks about linkages, about how primary and secondary activities link together. So 
if I'm buying raw materials and the production line is having difficulties because maybe uh, the suppliers wasn't the right supplier to be with, then in procurement, I can do my job and I can actually buy better quality materials, which improves the yield on the line or improves the performance of the production equipment. And so I, between us, or in, in that sense, the secondary activity of procurement is creating comp- competitive advantage by improving the product. So, you know, every stage of manufacture is a value-adding stage. If each stage doesn't add value, then, you know, it, sh- it shouldn't be there. Uh, so, but... It, it, <laughs> People, for some reason, even supply chain people, they don't like using the term value chain. And I think it's because it's seen as a, a business term, whereas actually it's a it's a term that should emphasize the fact that every stage of what I make has, has got to be more, have more value than, than, than the one before. That's right. And I don't know why they don't use it either, but I just thought about it. And, you know, I think using it actually probably would create more value for their organization. To talk a little bit about Janet Woodcock, I know you have a lot of respect and you had a lot of, uh, you know, you followed some of her initiatives. And for those who don't know, she was former director of CEDAR at FDA. She had a lot of the QBD sort of light and QBD, you know, big pharma type of initiatives that kind of transpired and, you know, went to some place. But um, what you said earlier was kind of interesting, everything under one house and one roof and, you know, there, there's a dock at the back where it goes out in the bus or a truck or something. And I think that we talked to a guy named Dave Adams who works for us. He's a, worked at Lonza. He's an API guy. He has a podcast coming or came out earlier this uh, this month. And he talked to me about and Miranda about some of the, you know, he started manufacturing in the late 70s when there was no GMP. There was no no regulatory. There was no QA. Everyone was called manufacturer. And it was a bunch of folks mainly that, from from what I understood, that sort of learned on the job. You know, they went in, they got a job, there was equipment, they worked there for 20 years, they made things, they got better at it. And then suddenly there was these concerns about safety and compliance. And, you know, folks started to know that from things that happened when product was shipped. Safety issues are certainly a concern. So, you know, they standardized things and then subsequently QA and regulatory came. So that was a that was a kind of an interesting progression in in that time i i wasn't working at that time i think i was watching cartoons or something like that probably at that stage but what what i did learn was you know that there was an evolution and i certainly see it now any any facility that i i haven't been to one for a while but when i used to maybe a couple years ago or i hear my colleagues talk about it i could see how they've transitioned you know some of the rules that they respect and and hold up now versus when some of them I worked with 15, 20 years ago, you know, things were different. They were just getting started and they didn't know the system or the process. So, but back to the the main question, I guess, is, you know, in modern world and the days of Amazon and Zoom video even here, when you when you talk about putting everything under one roof and having stuff come in and go out and everything's controlled, is that a possibility or reality? Everything seems to be outsourced, you know, to, to make the bottom line look a little bit better without trying to compromise quality. And I definitely agree with you to try to do QBD in that, you know, when there's seven, seven or eight parts, machines in different areas with different management and cultures, it's gonna, it's not going to be possible. But is that possible to, to ever happen again where th- everything happens under one roof? If you look at Big Pharma now, as most know, you know, they're, they're doing not as much manufacturing. It's outsourced. There's large uh, CMOs like Patheon and Catalan and, you know, have, who have absorbed that as you know sort of the outsource ease and they've made giant great businesses out of it barring just going back to the 70s or 80s is it possible moving forward is there any trends that you see that lead us to believe that you know we could get there again yeah a couple of things just to, to, to say there supply chain management in the drug industry in 2015 i had an email from regulatory affairs a, a, a department at the cuban regulatory authority saying, would you kindly send us a complimentary copy of your book? So I thought, well, I would have thought they could have afforded one, but uh, I thought, well, keep in with the regulators. So I sent them a copy. I've still, I've still got the airway bill that I sent it uh, with. And uh, someone I know at uh, Lonza, um, I, I, again, as someone I respect a, a lot, he's so Zulu, in 2018, we were on the call and he said, oh, I've just been to Cuba, you know, and he said, they're doing all the things in your book. They're making everything under one roof and they're integrated. And and I suddenly thought, by golly, they've, 
they've probably done it. But you have got to, you've got to do cultural and organizational things where you have to make R&D work as one unit, not as two separate units. So that's that's one thing. The other thing is, another someone I've got a lot of respect for, is Professor Andrew Cox, who set up the first uh, MBA in strategic procurement in the world in Birmingham University. He probably is the world's leading academic in, in procurement. And he's got this concept of critical assets. When you're doing a make versus buy decision, you keep your critical assets in-house, you make them yourself, and you buy in what's not critical. Now, product development has got to be critical. You know, that is where your comp- competitive advantage is. And I would say for small molecules, farmers are probably outsourced 95% of its development capability. Note this, 10 years ago, they were called CMOs. Now they're called CDMOs, Contract Development and Manufacturing Organization. So pharma cannot develop a drug without the contract base. And there's no skin in the game. This is what, in the 80s and 90s, this is what pharma did to itself. It gave its old employees, sent them out into the unknown, give them contracts for five years, where they have to make a success of things. And this is all written in Tame the Big Pharma Monster, so I'm not sort of making this up as, as I go along. And so these companies have grown into mega corporations who have become very, very successful. And, and why wouldn't they? Because they were basically just spun out. And this is why there are so few drugs getting to market these days, because the sponsors of the clinical trials don't have the capability to actually do the money. Even, you know, the, 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 between CROs and CDMOs, it's all in the hands of third parties. So so in terms of procurement, the industry has outsourced this critical asset. Now, Boeing tried, and this is, Boeing tried that in the 90s, I think it was. It's a, they outsourced, for the Dreamliner, they outsourced a much higher proportion of their components and they suffered an 18-month delay, huge cost overrun, and they had to bring it all back in-house. Their strategy was to move the risk into the supply base rather than their own supply base. But when you do that, you are, you almost increase your risk because the people you're working with, you, they haven't got the same level of communication, haven't got the same level of commitment. So the whole outsourcing, I would like to see a big farmer buy a CDMO and a CRO and say, okay, guys, let's put all this combined knowledge together and let's make drugs for patients. You know, let's engage with hospitals. Let's engage with the experts, uh, physicians in these various indications, sepsis, Alzheimer's, you know, blood cancers, and let's all use the skills that we've got. There are things you you need to outsource. If, if you can specify it quite simply, like third-party logistics, is you know is, is logical for outsourcing because you could say you know I want this to get from here to there I want you to use that mode of transport I want you to do this that and you can define it uh, and so a third party can make you know and you can measure it but with development you just can't you know you can't be prescriptive you have to sort of um, work with it as you go along and if the people you're working with you know don't have skin in the game because you chose that then you you can't say anything when you don't actually get the drugs to market. Hedley, that's a great explanation, actually. And I'm looking at a picture of your Taking Medicines Back to the Future blog article on your PharmaFlow website here. And I had some questions about it, but now it makes sense. It would be it would be interesting if a you know a sponsor bought a CRO and also a CMO and somehow turned that into something, you know, unique. I think that's where I think that's where you were going with that. So Getting on to some of the QBD actions, um, and I know Miranda has a lot of questions about QBD. She's very knowledgeable and, you know, but still learning. Cutting through the QBD foliage, aiming for the roots first. That's an excellent title there. I couldn't have come up with one better myself. So it actually does explain it. So just a little background before I get into some of my questions. The um, Quality by Design Initiative, I think that's kind of how our group started. I was in... um, Lar- well, I worked in manufacturing for a couple of years, and then I worked in big pharma, and I had exposure to this. And this is when it was beginning, probably in the early 2000s. And you know, there was intention to be able to 
do real time release and make changes without having um, supplements and change control and those things like that. And it all sounded great because, you know, it was modernization of what we used to do, which was, you know, having to maintain filings with all this data and how much we'd you put in, how much, you know, and there was a give and take. So it sounded like it was going to be a great thing. And I think, in my opinion, what happened was that, you know, the big pharma folks kind of got tied up into it too much and, you know, high volume products, um, those type of things like that. And it became more of a, a theoretical thing, right? And it kind of buzzwords abound, you know, you had conferences based on QBD and those things like that. And what I think everyone missed was, and not everyone worked in manufacturing like myself and then went to regulatory and saw this, these buzzwords, right? While I was interested and, you know, I was younger in my career and I said, this is probably what I need to do and start talking about and embrace. And I, and I thought it was a great concept too and idea, but what no one ever said, no one ever wrote anything about this, at least I haven't seen anything well written about it, was, you know, QBD is really just, you know, just good scientific based research and development, you know, doing the things that you're supposed to do, laying out the plans before you execute, you know, looking at what could potentially happen down the road, you know, seeing things that come up and addressing them. And I think that happens. I mean, I worked at Lanza on a, a small product back in late 90s, and they had rooms of notebooks and data and everything, right? It was for a big big pharma product. And none of that information translated into anything into a submission. The submission was, I think, 30 pages uh, late in a sta- uh, phase three. So there was tons of information, you know, where the sweet spot was when the process, where the edge of failures were, whatever you wanted to know about the formulation, you know, you, you add this, you change an excipient here, whatever. None of that was ever conveyed. The fact that they actually generated that much information was impressive. And, you know, in my mind, from what I, when I saw that and experienced that, that was quality by design. You know, that was kind of what you would say, you know, if we want to make an airplane the same way each time, we know if we use this metal, if we use this person, or if we build it here, you're going to know what you're going to get. And you're going to be able to tweak this or that to make sure that the end product looks like what it's supposed to look like in every time, right? So I think somehow some of the politics of QBD came in and, you know, I guess there was a, a lot of individuals that kind of put it up there and that was their claim to fame. And, you know, it never really translated into anything. Now, not to keep going on here, but, you know, lo- small emerging biotechs, even back then, and of, of course today, you know, very limited budgets. And if they have a budget, it's about time as well. They don't also have the time to put in all this money and time to generate all this data. They're they're racing to the market because they're, they're, there's a limited mi- a window of time versus their competitors. And a lot of them have an exit strategy. You know, it's either the partner with a large company or to, to license the product out and, you know, pick up another product and start developing it. So that was my opinion on QBD. And I, I think it's, you know, it's it's still out there. It's always been, it's called great, drug development, you know, smart drug development, doing it the right way, not cutting corners and stuff where you can't. And, but talk to us about that. I mean, I start cutting through the QBD foliage, aiming for the roots. Again, this is a blog on your website. You mentioned about gifted science scientists, you know, is, is it just for gifted scientists? From what I just mentioned, you know, this, this is what I believe that, you know, people that know how to know how to dr- develop a drug properly and appropriately. Can you kind of explain what you were talking about there? Yeah, well, I, I suppose going back to Janet Woodcock, you know, she famously said in 2002 with GMPs for the 21st century, she basically said, look, we, we don't want to regulate you. You want We want pharma companies to actually adopt best practices and make their products to the highest quality levels. And if I give you an example, if you think of semiconductors, you think of a clean room, you think of the quality levels for these wafers. Now, I'm not an expert on this, but I I do know people who work in the clean rooms in semiconductor, and they are not working to those Six Sigma quality levels because someone's told them to do that. They work into those because they know if they don't, the competition are probably going to hit on any quality of the issues they've got and they're going to lose business. So the problem is in pharma is that there is no competition because once you've got a patented molecule approved, the most that's going to happen is you you get an oligopoly where you sort of two or three companies make blockbuster revenue. So uh, the conclusion that I've come to is that unless there are changes to compound claims patent law, where you can claim a molecule as your own, even though you've got no evidence it could ever be um, a drug, it's incentivized the industry to turn away from 
the quality of the finished product towards let's just get an approval. You know, if we've got a, a choice between uh, solving a difficult prog- prog- a problem or doing something that will get us through an approval, you know, very often the, the wrong course is, is chosen. You can't do that in industries where it's competitive. The independent thing is that people think medicines, making medicines is different to anything else, and it's not. You know, you, with a medicine, you, you would never predict what anything going into a person's body, what that's going to do with, to the body. The body is the most complex, connected thing in the world. So when you talk about Alzheimer's, say, and people say, look, there's this amyloid beta that wraps itself around people's brains. So if we dissolve that, then we've got a drug. That's a theory. And more than 30 late stage trials in Alzheimer's have gone down based on a theory. You know, you've got, like what happened with, with penicillin, with all those drugs, those guys were actually building strong evidence that the molecule they had was working. You know, strong evidence of efficacy to the point where, you know, Salk injected his his family with uh, the polio vaccine. Um, and, and until they had that evidence, then the drug didn't go forward. Now, these days... Predictive technologies have come on an order of magnitude than they were 40 years ago, 50 years ago. So you've got things like organ on a chip where you can, you know, to a certain extent, you can predict what effect a, a compound is going to have on a heart, a liver, a kidney or, or whatever. And there's been a lot of work done on that in universities, but it's not being really harnessed by the industry. We stick into the old, let's test in animal models, you know, throw as many molecules at it as we can. One is going to come through in the end. I think people people are, are going to say this, this isn't good enough. Surgeons and doctors are starting to say that. For these latest CAR T therapies for the blood cancers, where it's patient specific, they have to take cells from the patient. They go through a process called apheresis where they spin out the, the the cells. That goes off to a manufacturing plant, maybe 300 miles down the road, stays there for two to six weeks, and by the time it gets back to the hospital, very often the patients passed away because they were very ill anyway. And the chances of that material being adulterated on, on those journeys, you know, it's got to be cryogenically frozen. So the logic says we have got to start to manufacture in hospitals, you know, we have got to help build a cadre of skilled manufacturing people who are half half physician, half a manufacturer. I'm not saying all of it, but using sort of postponement strategies where you can de-skill some of the operations so that the person, the person who actually is treating the patient, the healthcare professional, they are the pilots of aviation. So you wouldn't design the plane without talking to a pilot and engaging deeply with them. The the passengers assume that they've spoken to the pilot, so this plane is safe. The amount of patients now who want to get involved in the drug development process is is incredible. But if they could be confident in the fact that these drugs are going to be safe and effective, they wouldn't particularly be wanting to get involved. But the healthcare professional always has to be involved because he's the person who's translating a disease into a medical intervention. So that was actually fascinating, Headley, and I, it sounds like that you have pretty good knowledge on the cell therapy space these days. We'll have to save that for the next podcast. However, maybe QBD can be implemented in that setting in a hospital. That would be interesting. So Miranda, you had a few questions around QBD. Yeah, I was uh, reading your article and uh, QBD is something that I've come across in my past. Um, wasn't fully able to grasp it. And this conversation has been very enlightening. So in your opinion, what needs to change? You know, you mentioned the doctors being part of that change. Do you have any other insights on what might need to change to bring that back? Right. I think that we have to reverse the system dynamic that's happened over 40 or 50 years. So when a patent's awarded, if we ask for a greater amount of evidence that that compound is going to get to market, that it can be made in the sorts of quantities it has to be made. Numbers of clients I've worked with, they have tox failures in phase two, you know, late stage phase one, phase two, when really that should that should never happen. So we say, look, you're not going to get a patent until you've done, you've exhausted 
the prototyping technology that we now have to prove that that compound has got a future. Not beyond all doubt, but to a certain level of, of, of proof, because that's what's happened with taking medicines back. The, they always built the evidence that it was going to work before actually scaling up in manufacture. So what, one way would be to involve regulators in the patent approval process, so that uh, and this uh, visa have started uh, in Brazil. They've started to do that. It's still sort of a work in progress. But because you need people who understand science, technology in the patent award process, I use the example that you know if if I walked into the patent office and said I've got this molecule here, it's going to help cars hold the road, the car tires hold the road more effectively. Uh, they'd say, okay, then how do you know that? Well. Uh, it's, you know, it's my molecule. I, I'm sure it will. Yeah, but we're not going to give you a patent when you haven't got any evidence it's going to work. You, we're going to reward you for putting in the work to prove that this is going to be a commercial success. So you you can't prove this is going to be a commercial uh, success. So you're not going to have a patent. In every other sector, you have to prove it's commercializable. That's what the patent is about, so that other people can't pinch your commercial intellectual property. But I would argue in almost most of the molecules in pharma, there is no IP in there because they probably aren't going to be able to fit the mix of safety, efficacy, and quality that the filing requires. So, so once you start to ask some more evidence, the people developing drugs have to start talking to doctors to say, look, you know, can we do a bit more testing on this compound with the with the patient? Or can we try and understand a bit more? They start to build the knowledge of the compound, and that's what QPD is about. It's about building knowledge and understanding of the compound that you're developing. You know, not just in the test tube, but as you actually go to make it. You know, it's so. And then that starts a dynamic because when then doctors get involved, they get more involved. The regulators get more involved. There's more pre-competitive collaboration. You know, again. It's case in point with the COVID vaccine now, 36 in clinical trials, 200 odd uh, um, in total with preclinical and, and clinical. I mean, where's the value in all those companies you know, all working together, competing against each other in a race? You know, no one's going to win that. And certainly not the patient. You know, we've got to get back to the days when Fleming had his penicillium and he was going round to people saying, look, I found this. Can anyone help me find out what's inside it? Once you start to do that, you get more drugs coming to market because people start to learn really how to do it. And the other thing that people have noticed is that you can develop a drug now without being a pharma company. If you're a rare disease um, organization or there's one person I know, he's um, he's chair of the Kidney um, Association. His wife sadly died of, of, of a kidney condition. He uh, he speaks in Parliament about it. He knows more about medicines and side effects and uh, and um, how different drugs in, in, interact with the condition and foods than anyone in the pharma industry. And they're a charity now, with what we know here about the drug development process, he could come to us if we had if we had enough money. It wouldn't have to be the sort of money it costs to develop the drug at the moment, and say, "Look, this is what you've got to do. You need access to patients. Well, you've got that because you know you're a charity. All the people in there have got similar conditions. They so it, it's quite possible now to develop a drug. I, I wrote an article two years ago for the Medicines Discovery Catapult." Uh, Patients band together to develop their own drugs. This wasn't quite developing drugs because it was for diabetics, type 1 diabetics. They've got this hash, hashtag, we are not waiting. Because the pharma companies aren't developing the sort of technologies that they want, they've, they hack in, they put in their own solutions together and they have quite a lot, lot of success. When they learn as they go along, you could argue they may well be more compliant than some of the companies who claim to be compliant. I, I don't know, but that could be the, be the case. So, Headley, always thought-provoking. As I listen to you, I'm looking at this title, Taking Medicines Back to the Future, and it makes perfect sense. So I think you're uh, you're starting another trend here. We're going to sort of wrap it up a little bit here. Is there anything that you wanted to get out there? Any promotional stuff for your books? Any, any two-minute topics that you just want to touch on? And then we'll come back to that maybe in another podcast? 
Well, for, uh, last year I hosted a conference in Cardiff called Medicines for the 21st Century, Safe, Better, Cheaper. Actually, Janet Woodcock recorded a 12-minute video for, for, for that, which uh, I still got and I'm, I sort of I cherish, but I don't know that she's done anything like that for anyone outside of the, 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 the US. But it, they also had the Critical Path Initiative as well as GMP for the 21st Century, which to my mind is a roadmap for for actually getting engaged with doctors, biomarkers, clinical trials, but that hasn't gone anywhere either. But from that conference, there were about 60 of us there. Uh, we identified seven areas for improvement around the supply chain and letter of property, education, uh, and, and and those sort of things. I wrote a web paper from that, and that's gone to UK Parliament, and it's with the Health and Social Care Committee, asking them to hold an inquiry into patent law. Now, it's politics, so nothing may come of it. But the key factor that came out from that was education. So my next project is actually building digital education in the sort of things we're talking about now for strategic supply chain management, quality by design. Basically, describing this concept of where healthcare professionals are are part of the drug development process, an integral part, part of it, and helping them to understand the things that they need to know, um, simple GMP, you know, simple GDP. And I've actually got 10 or 12 people that I, I know from the olden days, of, I shouldn't say uh, olden days, but you know, people were there who, um, when that, Janet Woodcock was actually first starting this, like Emil Kurzik and Brian Carlin, and there's a range of those people. And I'm asking them for feedback on what they think we should be doing to to move this move this forward, to, you know, to have get more involvement in drug development, and uh, I'll be keeping you up to date on that as well, Ed. Yeah, and we'll we'll certainly add a uh, a link to that video that was impressive, and I think we've all been, at least folks my age and older, have been inspired by Janet Woodcock and some of the things that she started to bring about at the FDA. So, you know, you could certainly see some of the changes that have have come into effect, especially with some new technology. So. Headley, it's always great talking to you. Um, you know, one thing I just noticed, how much you recognize individuals out there and you empower people at, and also recognize them for what they've done. I heard many names. Brian Carlin, I think I've met, you know, Janet Woodcock, I've met through guidances and ish, initiatives and those things like that. You even actually mentioned Jonas Salk. If you, you can't see this out there in the podcast, but behind me, I have a University of Pittsburgh flag. That's where I went to college and that's where the famous uh, Salk vaccine was invented, right? 1957. So Headley, you're a famous author. You don't know it for our industry. You're a pioneer for value chains and you're clearly still an, a leader in these initiatives. So keep it up. You don't even know it. Taming the Big Pharma Monster by Speaking Truth to Power. We can find that, I guess, on Amazon these days or you can Google it, right? Yes, yeah, it's, it's on Amazon and it's all, all this, you know, ebook platforms and it's difficult getting a platform to, to say these sorts of things. And I remember in 2011, you put a, um, a, um, an endorsement on on my LinkedIn profile, which um, really encouraged me because in, in those days, it's better now, but, you know, people saw me as a bit of a heretic and a bit of a sort of left field player. <laughs> so I do thank you for that. And I'm sure we'll do more together and help drive change uh, change in this industry. Right. And also just final to say, I learned it all from you and I'm not complaining about it. So thanks so much. Talk to you soon. Okay. You take care. Yeah. Cheers. <laughs> On our next podcast, Miranda Bryan and I will be talking about the CTD module three. So though the content of these modules is generally well-defined, considerable latitude for assimilating, discussing, comparing, and contrasting the data is allowed and even encouraged. There's going to be opportunities to be creative, to tell a story and to craft cohesive arguments to help regulatory bodies understand your product. So join us then for an in-depth discussion. Thanks for listening. To read the full show notes for this episode, which include a summary, timestamps, and any links mentioned in this episode, please visit dsinformatics.com forward slash podcast. There you'll find the information from this episode and any past episodes. If you're enjoying this podcast, please leave us a rating and a review at ratethispodcast.com forward slash cmc live. We'll be sure to read these out on future episodes.